We're so glad you've joined us in another episode of The Last Empire, Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. In this episode, we're going to be looking at Armageddon, fear no evil. You know, the Bible says that we are in the midst of a final battle for global control. We've been noticing that in our series so far. And the Bible tells us that it's a battle for worship, for allegiance, your allegiance and my allegiance. Now, three great powers called Babylon the Great, that's the dragon, the beast from the sea and the beast from the land, these three powers called Babylon the Great, they represent all religions, all worldviews that are opposed to God and his word in the end of time. That's what Babylon the Great represents. Now, they lead to the global worship of Satan. Everybody almost all over the world sadly is going to worship Satan by following the things that come from the dragon through the beast from the sea and the beast from the land. Now, they do this by enforcing the beast's mark and that nobody can buy or sell unless they receive that mark and so this is one of the ways they get people to, to join them in their rebellion. Because people are in danger of worshipping Satan, God sends his messages from the three angels to call people to worship God so that they don't have destruction, so that they can be saved. So he sends these three messages and their messages are this, worship God as creator, he is your redeemer, he died to save you, worship him, the one who died because he loves you and he made you and therefore he rescues his children. And after this, after that showdown between those two forces seeking worship, the three beasts and the three angels, after that, then comes the seven last plagues. And that's what we need to have a look at right now in this episode together. John says, after he sees that conflict over worship, notice what he sees. Revelation 15 verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God, says John. These seven last plagues are the wrath of God against those who cling to sin and turn against God's people. It's God is bringing his salvation to his people by putting down their enemies at such a time as this. These plagues are filled in them as filled up the wrath of God. Now the plagues are actually the result of a rebellious world separated from God. They're the consequence of separation from the source of life. God, you see, will remove his protective hand and all the evil forces will break loose because this is the choice that people have made because they don't want God, so then he has to remove his protective hand. Now, do God's people go through the seven last plagues? That's a very good question. Let's answer that question by looking at some things from the Bible. Number one, you remember there were ten plagues in Egypt. These plagues fell on the nation, on the country of Egypt, where Israelites were living. Now, God's people were in those plagues, but God protected them from those plagues. So while they went through Egypt's plagues, they were protected in those plagues. Now, number two, you think about the fact that not only were the Israelites protected in the plagues, but what about Daniel's friends? You remember Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These three young men went into the fiery furnace, you recall. So they went into the fiery furnace, but what happened when they went into that troublous time? Jesus was with them. The Bible says God protected them. He cared for his own even though he went through that trial. Now Revelation shares very clearly that God's people go through these plagues, but they go through victoriously. John says these words, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. That's the final plagues you see. And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
The Bible is very clear that God's people go through the plagues. God's people have always suffered down through time. Isaiah was beheaded. You remember John the Baptist was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. Our Lord was crucified. So why do people in the end time expect to miss these things? Yes, they go through, but God protects them very clearly. He protects them in a marvellous way. Notice what the psalmist says in Psalms 91. The Bible says these words, Those who live in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, those who have a relationship with God. He will cover you with his feathers like a mother hen covers her chickens. And under his wings you shall trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. That's why we've said in this series, my friend, Time and time again, it's important for us to follow the truth because truth protects us, certainly will protect us in the time of the plagues. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. It's important that you and I follow truth. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, the Bible says, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall behold and see the reward of the wicked, the Bible says, because why you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your habitation. There shall no evil come to you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling, God says. God will protect his people. Why? He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. What a God, you see. While God's people go through the plagues, no plague comes near their dwelling. God is our protection. God, you see, the Bible says, is our security. In Christ, God's people are safe. In Christ, we are secure and we are sheltered in the arms of God during these plagues. Now these plagues, the Bible says, fall on Babylon and all who are inside of Babylon, who stay in Babylon and don't come out in heeding the call of God. Why do the plagues come on Babylon? Because of her sins, the Bible says. They're mounted up to heaven. Babylon is full of demons. So the plagues come on Babylon. And that's why God makes a night cry. The last call for human beings is the one in Revelation 8 and come out. My people come out of Babylon. Why? Because the plagues are coming. Notice what the Bible says here in Revelation 18, God's last call to human beings. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her sins. So the plagues come on Babylon. And that's why God calls us to leave. So let's look at these plagues now. Let's go through them quickly one by one. The first plague, the Bible says, is a plague of sores. Notice what God says in Revelation chapter 16. The first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and there fell a terrible and grievous sore upon the men. Now notice who it comes to? Upon the men, and that includes humans, men and women, which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. So the first plague is upon those who take the beast mark and worship that image of the beast. That, In other words, the beast from the land makes an image of the beast. Protestant America, that is moved away from God's word. The plague comes on those who receive the beast mark and those who worship the image that way. Now, because people choose the beast mark, God gives them their choice. He allows them to have what they chose, choose. God never forces anybody, but there are consequences to our choices. Now, God said, don't receive the beast mark, which is Sunday worship. In the end of time, our allegiance to the beast will be seen by the fact that we keep a tradition of man that's in opposition to one of the commandments of God. In the end of time. And we saw that the church makes this statement that Sunday is their mark of authority. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. 
says the church, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. People want the beast mark. They want to take this day of worship. God allows them their choice. How do people choose the beast mark? Here's how they will choose the beast mark above God's commandment, above the Sabbath. Here's how. The Bible says no one, no one could buy or sell unless they had the mark. You see, people take the mark of the beast, many of them, simply because they want to be able to buy and sell. Those things will be more important to people than God himself. And now God allows them their choice. They received the beast mark, you see, for economic security. They thought by taking the beast mark, they would have economic security. They would be able to buy and sell. But too late, they discover that the beast mark fails to deliver economic security. And now they are marked with sores all over them. God allows them the freedom of their choice. That's what they wanted. God has to allow them to have that choice. He respects our freedom of choice. But there are consequences. See, the Bible is telling us that Christ, in Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath, this is our only security. It's not found in economic security, only in the Lord of the Sabbath himself. Plague number two, the sea turns to blood, John says. The Bible says, Revelation 16, 3, the second angel poured out his bowl upon the sea and it became like the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. Now you think about it. In the Bible, the seas represent the masses of humanity. You see, people think that there's security in following the crowd. Many people follow others because of peer pressure and so on, because they thought that's their security, following the crowd. But sadly, the sea of humanity is no security in that, and now the seas literally turn to blood, and so people, those in the seas, die. You see, our security, the Bible is telling us in this plague, is only found in following Christ, not in following the sea of humanity, the crowd. Now the sea literally turns to blood. Number three plague, the rivers and the springs turn to blood, the Bible says. Notice what John saw here in the third plague. And the third angel poured out his bowl of plagues on the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are righteous, O Lord, who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged the way you have. They have shed the blood of your saints the and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for this is what they deserve, the Bible says. You see, what's going on here with this third plague is this. People rejected the waters of life from Christ's servants. Notice that? That's what the waters represent, the fountains and the springs. They rejected the water of life that the servants of God presented to them. They killed them, in fact, John says there. They took, shed their blood, hoping to find security in silencing them and thus to deaden their own consciences. They tried to find security by killing God's people and silencing them. And now God allows them the freedom of their choice. They wanted blood. They killed God's servants. Now God allows them the choice. And now the freedom of their choice brings to them blood. And they go to the tap and all that comes out is blood. They go to the rivers and all that comes out is blood. You see, there are consequences to our choices. That's what God is trying to warn us about here in these plagues. He's not trying to be hard on us. He's just saying, this is what's coming. There are consequences to our choices in life. You see, security is found only in listening to Christ, not in putting our fingers in our ears and turning from the truth. Only found in following Christ, the Bible says. Plague number four, the Bible says there is scorching sun that comes upon those under the fourth plague. Notice what the Bible says here. John says, And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to it to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now what is going here on here? You see, the Bible tells us that sadly people will refuse the Sabbath, God's sign of allegiance. They will choose the Sunday. 
here. They choose the day of the sun. And so now God allows them to have the sun. They wanted a tradition of man and rather than a commandment of God to follow him. And so now he allows them their choice. And they are, now the sun that they wanted scorches them. Consequences, you see, to our choices. You know, this idea of the Sabbath is a very important issue. Notice what the Bible says in the passage here from Jeremiah. If you will not heed me to follow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, says God, then I will kindle a fire in its gates and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. You see, God is very particular here. The Sabbath is the sign that he is Jehovah God and that he made us, and that he cleans up our life. And when we turn from the Sabbath, we turn from the Lord of the Sabbath, and God allows us, but there are consequences to those choices. And God is very serious. He wants us to know from these plagues that our security is found only in resting with the Lord of the Sabbath, not in turning away from him, which the Sabbath points us to. Our security is only found in resting in the Lord of the Sabbath. Plague number five is darkness. Notice what the Bible says under the fifth plague now. John says, And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the seat of the beast. In other words, on the headquarters of the beast. The beast from the sea, that is. And his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, God says in his word. Imagine chewing on your tongue because of the pain of the darkness. Darkness so intense. You see, this plague comes on the Church of Rome and the various headquarters of the Church of Rome, the beast from the sea. Why? Because you see, these people sadly turned away from the word of God and led people to follow the darkness of error. And now God allows those leaders to have the darkness. They rejected the light of the word from his word and his commandments. And God allows them their choice and so now they have darkness literally comes upon them. And a terrible time for those who turn from truth and righteousness and lead others in that direction. The Bible says of this plague, Revelation 16, 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they repented not of their deeds. You notice what's happening here. When we see these people, they have hardened hearts and closed minds and they don't repent even with these plagues. Their minds are fixed on rebellion, sadly, against God and his word. You see, my friend, it is extremely dangerous to turn from Bible truth. It leads to darkness and one day it will lead to literal darkness for those who are leaders and turning other people from truth and turning them to the darkness of error. You see, security, in other words, this plague is telling us, is only found in following Christ, the light of the world, only found in following truth, which is called the light of God in the Bible. This is our only security. Plague number six is an interesting one. The Bible says the river Euphrates is now dried up. Notice what John saw. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now you remember that the Euphrates River flowed through the ancient city of Babylon. It was Babylon's life support system. Without the Euphrates River, Babylon would cease to be. It was the waters of Babylon that made it prosperous. So now these waters the Bible says are going to be dried up. Not the literal waters of Babylon we're going to notice because of what the Bible teaches. The Euphrates River was code for Babylon, you see, in Revelation. Euphrates means Babylon the Great, which sat on the river Euphrates. You remember that King Cyrus, the Medo-Persian king, as we saw, dried up. He was a king from the east. East of Babylon was Medo-Persia and he dried up the Euphrates River and took Babylon. And when he took Babylon, he let God's people go back to Jerusalem. He let them go home again. He was like a deliverer from the east. He came, dried up the river Euphrates and then he took God's people, allowed God's people to go home, delivered them from Babylon. The waters of the Euphrates John tells us, represent masses of people. Notice what John said. 
Revelation 17, 15. The waters which you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. This is what this means here. In other words, Babylon the Great, made up of the dragon, the sea beast and the land beast, these three powers which represent all religions and worldviews that are no longer following God and his, his word, these three powers gather everyone to Armageddon. People support them. The rivers, the masses flow into Babylon through, these, the, through the ways that they use to gather them. The masses flow in to support Babylon in actual fact at first. How does that happen? We noticed how that happened. John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons performing miracles, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Do you notice what's happening here? It's miracles. It's signs, it's wonders that these three powers do that gather, we saw, the people to Babylon and thence to Armageddon, where they are taken, the Bible says. Demonic global deceptions lead people to support Babylon at first, lead people to flow into Babylon, but too late they see through the whole thing and then under the sixth plague support dries up. Signs and wonders for Babylon gather them to Babylon and lead them to worship Satan and the support of Babylon ends after that. When people see through where these powers have taken them to destruction ultimately, their support is withdrawn. The Euphrates River is dried up. No longer do they flow into Babylon, but it's too late. They've left it too late and they fail to have eternal life. You see, Jesus Christ, the Bible is telling us, the, like Cyrus, the king from the east, he's coming to destroy Babylon, to gather his people, to rescue his people and deliver them from the great modern end time Babylon. Jesus is coming for his people and to deliver them. The Bible puts it this way, The day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. But to you that fear my name, that means who love and respect me, shall the sun of righteousness rise in the east. The sun rises in the east. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Jesus will come for his people on the great day of his wrath. And then comes the seventh plague. The sixth plague is the gathering to Armageddon and then finally the people see through it too late. They've been taken to the battle of Armageddon by these three powers and their support withdraws from them, but it's too late because now comes the battle of Armageddon. The sixth plague is the gathering to Armageddon. The seventh plague is the battle. Notice the gathering here again. They are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Now this brings us to the subject of the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon, you will notice, is God's battle. It's not man's battle. The battle of the great day of God Almighty. John puts it this way in Revelation 16 as he sees this battle. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and there was great earthquake. Then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Under this plague there is a, a mighty earthquake that takes place during the time of what John calls the battle of Armageddon. In Revelation chapter 4 to 8, we have the seven seals of Revelation. And notice what takes place under the sixth seal. It's the same as what takes place under the seventh plague. Notice what John saw. John says in Revelation chapter 6 now, the Bible says, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of its place. That's that great earthquake that John had mentioned in Revelation chapter 16, the seventh plague. 
Every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Notice it there. Here is the coming of Jesus Christ. But it's called the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 16. It's the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now you see, Armageddon, there is a special town in Israel on the plain edge of the plain of Jezreel called Megiddo. Let's go there. Notice Armageddon, the plain of Jezreel in the background there. A very important plain because on this plain in ancient times, many great battles were fought where God fought for his people. The word har or Har or Ar is the word mountain in the Hebrew. Armageddon, mountain. Megiddo is the word for Megiddo, a city fortress on the edge of the plain of Jezreel. Ar, mountain, mountain of Megiddo. Now you can visit Megiddo today. You will notice here the little tell or hill there, Megiddo. That's where the fortress of Megiddo was. The Egyptians had a fortress here. Solomon had a fortress here. This was a very strategic place overlooking this battleground through ancient times because trade routes ran right through here from Mesopotamia through Syria down to Egypt. So a very strategic place. And from Megiddo, you look out across the plain of Jezreel. Now Megiddo means slaughter. That's what the word Megiddo means. So Har-Megiddon means the mountain of slaughter or the mountain of destruction. Now this was the site of strategic battles even in the Bible. You remember Gideon when his 300 soldiers fought thousands of Midianites in this plain here. God fought with them and for them to protect them and to deliver them from their enemies. And there was a great slaughter of their enemies because God fought for them to deliver his people. This was the area where a great conflict took place on Mount Carmel. Here on Mount Carmel, it overlooks the valley of Jezreel. And Megiddo is at the, toward the end of the Mount Carmel range. You will recall that there was a great Conflict here between the prophets of Baal and Elijah the prophet. Elijah came to show them that God was truly God in Israel, not Baal. And after that conflict, Elijah took the prophets down here to this stream down here and he had them killed here. And you can even see today on Mount Carmel a statue of Elijah having these men killed. 850 prophets of Baal. Why did God do that? Why did he do that? Because these prophets of Baal had led the nation into charge, into things like a prostitution, temple prostitution, and later on, human sacrifice. And God said, you men have led the whole nation astray. The society is becoming corrupt. Families are falling apart. People are turning from God. You're not repentant. You need to be destroyed. And Elijah had them destroyed. Babylon the Great, you see, leads to false worship and an attack on God's end time remnant people in the end of time. So God comes to deliver his people, to fight against those power in order to deliver his children. Jesus is pictured now in Revelation as coming as a king on a white horse. This is how his second coming is depicted. Not that he's coming on a white horse, but he's coming like a conquering king to rescue his people from their enemy, to put down their enemies, to rescue his friends. This is what takes place at the return of Jesus Christ. John says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it judges and makes war. This is the battle, you see. And his name is called the Word of God. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God Almighty. John goes on to say now, Watch what happens in this battle or war, this battle of Armageddon. He says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. The battle of God Almighty, you see. Then the beast was captured and with him, John says, the false prophet 
who deceived those who'd received the mark of the beast, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, lake burning with fire and brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh, says John. There is a great battle that takes place. This is the battle of Armageddon, which takes place when Jesus comes for his people to rescue his people, he must destroy their enemies. My friend, there is a day coming when Jesus is coming to rescue his people and sadly many will run from him on that day because they didn't run to him when the opportunity was theirs and now they turn on God's people and so God has to destroy them. Now many people feel that the great armies of the world will be gathered here on these plains of Jezreel that we see there in in Israel today. But the Bible is not talking about this. You would never fit all the armies of the world in that great valley. It's not big enough. This is a global battle. And this is symbolizing for us the great battle of the God Almighty when he comes to rescue his people. It's not man's battle between the armies of this world. These armies turn their weapons on Christ who comes. And he comes for the whole world everywhere for his people to deliver them. We would never fit into this plane. Now, you know, these are the seven last plagues. But the truth is, not one single person need receive any of these plagues. Not one of us need receive these plagues. God has made a way of escape for everybody, the Bible teaches. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. And what happened to Jesus on the cross of Calvary mirrors the seven last plagues. You think of what happened to Jesus. Really, he took what those seven plagues stand for way back there 2,000 years ago. You think of the first plague. What happened to Jesus? He was marked. Just as people will be marked with sores, Jesus was marked. His back was lacerated. His hands were nailed to the cross. His head was was scarred with the crown of thorns that was pushed into his forehead and beaten with sticks the bible says you see jesus was marked so that we will never be marked with sores jesus christ will bear those scars for eternity because of his love for you and i we need never receive those marks those sores because jesus was marked for us when he was here on earth number two jesus died for the sea of humanity. His blood was shed for everyone. There's not one person whom the blood of Christ is not available to. All of humanity, the vast sea, so that we will never be part of that seventh, second plague where the seas turn to blood and everything in it dies. Jesus has shed his blood like a great ocean for the world. Think of plague number three. Christ was the source of life, but he shed his blood for human beings so that we might never drink blood he shed his blood for you and I if we just receive what he did on the cross for us think of the fourth plague the fourth plague was 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 the plague of sun that scorched human beings that will scorch human beings what did Jesus cry out on the cross I thirst Jesus understood what's going to happen under the fourth plague when men will be scorched There on the cross as he was exposed to the elements, Jesus cried, I thirst. He understands. He took that plague on himself really there at the cross of Calvary. Think of what happened when Jesus went with died. The Bible says darkness gathered around the cross. Darkness went around for about six hours, around the three hours, I should say, around the cross of Calvary. There was darkness. Why? Because Jesus Christ entered into Satan's kingdom when he took our sin. He entered into the kingdom of the evil one to rescue us, to save us from a darkness that's one day coming where people will gnaw their tongues. Christ has already taken that plague at the cross. Think of the sixth plague where people, their support will be withdrawn from Babylon and those leaders will feel terrible because everybody removes their support from them. You know, Christ has experienced that. At the cross, support was withdrawn from Jesus. The Bible says that at the cross, people rejected him. 
his disciples turned from him. They ran away from him. They stood afar off. The soldiers mocked him. Even the criminals that died with him mocked Jesus. Even the priests laughed at him and the soldiers. And it even seemed that God has rejected his son almost because Jesus cried on the cross, My God, why have you forsaken me? Where is your support, my father? Why did Jesus go through this? Because he does not want us to go through a situation where we have no support. He has been through that. What happened to Jesus at the cross? You remember, there was a mighty earthquake. That earthquake rent the city of Jerusalem and Mount Calvary as Jesus died. What was happening? It seemed as if God was judging Christ, and he was, because he who knew no sin became sin, and the judgment of God was on Christ. That's what earthquakes often stand for, the judgment of God. Not only that, but Jesus cried out on the cross, It is finished. What is finished? You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was praying there and he said, Oh, Father, let this cup be removed from me. What cup? The cup of wrath, the cup of the, the plagues. Jesus was drinking the plagues for us, taking the plagues so that we don't have to drink them. He was suffering the wrath of God on himself because of taking our sin. When he said it is finished, he meant the cup is empty. I have taken all of the wrath of God. Human beings do not need to experience it. You see, it seemed as if God was saying, Jesus, my son, I can have no more to do with you. You have been made sin. And the wrath of God was taken by Jesus. So we need never feel these plagues. What an amazing God. What a God that he could see the plagues coming. And so he took a course of action to protect us from those plagues. My friend, in the final battle of global control is a battle for worship and allegiance. And God wants you and I to be on his side in this great battle because if we choose the side of Satan, the end result is eternal destruction. And God does not want us to be experiencing that. Some years ago, way back in the, ancient, the times of the ancient Romans, the emperor gave a command that no soldier in his army could worship anyone else but him. Caesar must be number one in the life. And the Caesars were regarded as gods from time to time. And this order was given to the commanding officers of various units of the Roman army. And there was an army unit up there in northern Europe there, and they were camped beside a lake in the freezing middle of the winter, freezing cold. And when the commander of this army unit received this command, he knew what would happen. He had 40 of his best soldiers whom he knew were Christians, and he knew what they would do when the command was given that you can only worship the emperor. He knew that they would not do that. So he had to follow through with the order. So he gathered all the men together in his, in his unit. And he said, men, the emperor has given a command that we can only worship the emperor if we want to be in this army. We cannot belong to the army unless we turn from worship of other gods to him. Well, he said, I want you to take 40 paces forward if you were to follow the emperor's orders. When he gave the command, every man moved forward Three paces, I should say, except 40 men. They stayed where they were. The commander knew that would happen, and it did. So he called the 40 men forward, and he said, Men, take off your clothes, every stitch of it. They stripped completely naked. And then he had some soldiers march them out to the middle of the frozen lake, way out there on the frozen lake, and left them there with no clothes on. Then he sat down beside his fire, there at the camp. And as he sat there around his campfire, he heard a song coming from way out in the middle of the lake. On the still cold air, it said these words were heard, 40 brave warriors standing firm for you, O God. And that song kept being repeated through the night, but got weaker as time went on. And finally he heard a change in the words, 39 warriors standing true for you, O God. And in the flickering light of the campfire, 
some moments later, he saw a man crawling across in towards the fire. He had given up because of the cold and he collapsed in front of the fire. The commander looked at that soldier, listened to those words, 39 warriors standing firm for you, and his mind began to work. And slowly after a while, he began to unbutton his tunic. He began to undo his coat, took off his coat, took off all his armour and stripped himself naked. And then that commanding officer ran out onto the lake to join those 39 men. And then the song was heard now a little stronger, 40 brave warriors standing firm for you, O Lord. You know, my friend, God wants you and I to make a choice for him. The choice is for God or against God. He that is not with me is against me. And God is calling you to follow Jesus Christ in everything that he's revealed to you. Won't you make that decision to be one of his true followers in the end of time that we're living in? Won't you determine to say, God, I will put you first above people, above things. I will make you my saviour and my Lord. Won't you decide that today? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you so much that the Bible is so true. May we determine today that we will follow Jesus and Jesus alone, that we will follow his words, whatever comes our way, because of your love to us. Bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're glad that you were with us for this episode of The Last Empire, Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. You must not miss the next episode in our series when we take you to look at the showdown of the gods, the return of Elijah the prophet. Is Elijah the prophet returning again at the end of time? Don't miss showdown of the gods. We'll look forward to being with you in that episode.